If you're not trying to sell cars to everyone, you don't have to make cars that everyone likes. The smaller premium car makers do best with polarizing designs which 90% of buyers will reject, but which the other 10% will love sufficiently to forgive a few failings and choose in favor of the omni-capable offerings of the German Big Three. Some buyers like to make a statement by not making the obvious choice. But you have to offer them a car which is genuinely different, and not just a less expensively developed clone of a BMW, Audi or Mercedes. Lexus has done difference more consistently than most low-volume luxury rivals. You can't dispute its laser focus on hybrid drive, craftsmanship and, more recently, design. Off the record, design directors at other brands acknowledge how much they admire it. And now here's the new flagship Lexus, which has to embody all these virtues and more, and which can be truly love it or hate it because Lexus UK only needs 100 people each year to love it enough to buy it. Yes, 100. I double checked because I thought they'd missed a zero off. Around 2,500 Mercedes S classes are sold here annually, and around 2,000 each of the BMW 7 Series and Tesla Model S. I asked the Lexus UK boss to make some vague generalizations about the demographic he's targeting with the LS, although he probably knows them all by name. If you're a target buyer, chances are you're the eco-CEO of your own firm in the tech or creative industries, drawn by the fact that the LS is exclusively hybrid in the UK and thus projects the right image, and buying it both to drive yourself and be driven in. I'd usually let you decide for yourself about a car's exterior design but as you're unlikely ever to see an LS in the middle, here's what I think. I love it. In proportion if not in detail, this is how the Maserati Quattro Porte, not a fan, should have looked. The ELS is based on the same steel and aluminium platform as the LC Coupe, but stretched in the middle. So the new LS acquires not only a coupe profile but also a much lower, coupe-like stance. The wheelbase is 35mm longer than the outgoing long wheelbase LS but some clever surfacing trickery just forward of the rear arches seems to pinch the bodywork in, and lends this long car's line's dynamism and development as they flow backwards. And this being a Lexus, the detailing is crazily complex but perfectly resolved, it has the mad, 5000 surface spindle grille, of course, but the headlamps and air intakes around it are a more subtle triumph. It's rare to get into a car and find materials or techniques you've never seen in a cabin before. Our test car's doors were trimmed with cloth hand pleated using origami techniques, and the door pulls were great lumps of carved Kiriko glass. They are distinctively Japanese and unnecessarily beautiful, but they're also a £7,600 option even on a £97,995 top spec premier car. Without them, the cabin design is still striking, with a band of fins which run across the dash and the focused, leather-bound central binnacle. 
The premier spec includes an ottoman function which motors the front passenger seat away and extends the rear seat behind to allow the occupant to stretch out with a calf support. But without this option the LS doesn't offer flagship levels of rear legroom, two six-footers can sit in line in comfort, but not with space to spare. Think Quattroporte rather than S-Class. CEO's intent on both lounging and saving the planet might do better to buy a Skoda Superb and plant a forest with the saving. Chassis refinement is good, if not class leading. The ride is fine, if not quite as cloud-like as the best rivals. The wheels have been designed with resonance chambers in the hollow spokes to cut higher noise, and the 23-speaker Mark Levinson audio system listens for and actively cancels road noise. But, sadly, it can't entirely cancel the sound of the engine. It's a 3.5-liter Atmo V6 with a new Lexus multi-stage hybrid system and a CVT transmission, first seen in the LC Coupe and retuned slightly for the saloon. Its system total of 354 bhp is worked hard by the 2340 kg mass of the car. Exiting a roundabout at the pace of a chauffeur just starting to get worried about delivering you to the airport on time easily sends the needle to 3000 revolutions per minute or beyond to deliver the required torque, and an unpleasant moo wine thrash into the cabin. Peak doesn't arrive until 5,100 revolutions per minute, and there's only 258 pounds foot of it. Acceleration improves on the outgoing cars at 5.5 seconds to 62 miles per hour, and claimed consumption is reduced to 39.8 miles per gallon for the all-wheel drive versions which will be most popular here. If you want to drive fast, which hardly seems the point in this car, it has adequate shove, and the stiff platform and optional air suspension provide reasonable body control and accurate if inert steering. But the driveline always gives the impression that you're asking it to do things it would rather not. The car's deputy chief engineer told me there hadn't been time to hybridize the twin-turbo version of the V6 before this car was launched, but the job was now in hand. More torque lower down would probably solve both the refinement and the engagement issues, and make the LS a much better car. Until then. The LS500H will definitely polarize buyers. At least 90% will reject it, job done. But I wonder if even the 1.4% of UK customers for such cars whom Lexus hopes to win over will see past the refinement issues, or the lack of the rear seat options or almost sentient levels of tech which the German Big 3 can offer because the cost is amortized over their greater volumes. With great visual design and an original and beautifully made cabin this is a proper Lexus. But a hybrid drivetrain no longer counts for much when the main rivals will all soon offer plugins which will get you from your office in W1 to Heathrow on electric power. In this case, different may not be enough, and 100 cars a year no longer looks like a typo.